So Ray Dalio is back on YouTube and his most recent video is actually a really cool 10 minute explainer on whether we're currently in a stock market bubble. Now, Ray is obviously the founder of Bridgewater Associates, the most successful hedge fund the world has ever seen. <laughs> He's been investing for over 50 years and throughout his investing career, he has studied the history of economics in insane detail to help him understand how various economic situations tend to play out in the market. Although I must say, for someone that's so successful, I was very surprised to see his latest video clearly hashtag sponsored by Robinhood. Hi everyone. Uh it's, it's so good to be here on behalf of all the people that are being helped by Robin Hood. Um... Yes, that's obviously way out of context. Ray is definitely referring to this Robin Hood as opposed to that Robin Hood. But anyway, as I said, this video is all about Ray analyzing whether we're currently in a stock market bubble. And to do so, he breaks it all down into six points. So let's roll the intro and then get into point number one. This video is sponsored by Stake. Download the Stake app today and use the referral code AWC to get a free stock when you fund your account. Details in the description. First, uh, you know, how, how high are prices relative to the traditional measures of um, prices is a consideration. For example, you know, are PEs high or um, yields uh, low and that kind of thing. That's a consideration, but it, I, it's not what I mean by a bubble. Let's let's say, for example, you can have prices high, which means uh, returns low, and you can have that go on for a very long time. That doesn't mean a bubble pops. So I'm really looking at whether you get a pop, but still it's an ingredient. So how high prices are relative to traditional measures? And Ray classifies the market as somewhat frothy on this point. And I find this really interesting because I would call this one a bubble. Even if we look at a measure like the Schiller PE, which is kind of like a big PE ratio for the S&P 500, we can see it currently sits at 38, which is almost the highest it's ever been. Certainly higher than 1929 and 2008, just not quite as high or as steep as the tech bubble. But the reason Ray says, you know, somewhat frothy as opposed to full on bubble is because he compares stock valuations to bond valuations. And he gave the example that, you know, if you invested in bonds right now, you're roughly accepting a 75 times price to earnings ratio on these bonds, depending on what bond market you're looking at. So if stocks right now have a PE ratio that's currently 38, that still seems like a better place to park your money than in bonds. So that's why Ray doesn't really call this point a full on bubble. But all right, let's move on. Point number two. The second is prices are discounting unsustainable conditions. So unsustainable starts to be part of this picture of a bubble. Uh, unsustainable means that by the nature of the buying, whoever is doing the buying and how have that supply demand, that means that that won't be sustained and that produces a correction or prices going down. Now, I thought Ray could have done a slightly better job at explaining this point because I'm not sure I exactly understand what he's talking about here, but I believe what he's saying is that this criteria examines whether share prices now reflect unsustainable growth rates for the future. Because the way that you value businesses is you grow the cash flows out into the future by a certain growth rate then you discount that back to what you would pay today for those future cash flows. And this is basically how all investors value stocks. Now, I won't go into the details here, but if you are interested in how that actually works and you want to see an example, then check out the video that's coming up on the screen right now. But if a share price is really high today, that means whoever bought the stock at that price is clearly expecting monstrous growth in the future. So I think what Ray is really saying with this point is, you know, are prices today reflecting unsustainable growth rates that investors are using in their valuation models? And for him, interestingly, he doesn't believe so. So Ray clearly sees an environment where growth can continue out into the future. All right, let's move on into points three and four. 
And then um, it, it, there's this speculative element, number three. So one of those measures of the speculative elements is new buyers in the market. They're attracted in the market. You know, it's the sort of thing where, you know, you go to a cocktail party and people who are never involved in the thing are investing in it. And that could be tech stocks and it could be real estate and whatever, but, you know, they're drawn in and that there's a big bullish sentiment. So everybody wants not having these things makes you feel dumb that kind of thing. So Ray calls this one frothy and I definitely agree. Right now, there are a lot of new market participants and a lot of them are getting real speculative with their buyers. I mean, Robinhood alone now has around 18 million users and that's versus 7.2 million just one year ago. So there's huge amounts of new buyers and they're cashed up and they're ready to go. They are everyday Joes, they have the money and they want in on this game we call investing. And Ray is right, when you start hearing people talk about, you know, AMC and GameStop at a cocktail party, that's when you start getting worried. I mean, anecdotally, at the clinic I used to work at, all the physios during their lunch break started talking about buying Bitcoin. <laughs> and that's definitely a sign that a bubble is forming. So I think Ray is definitely right on this one. And then point four, you bet, there is huge bullish sentiment. As Ray says, this is the fear of missing out element that, um, you know, if you don't own this stuff, you feel stupid. You know, people get in on trends and that makes other people feel like they're missing the boat. So then they get on, which then leads to another wave of people that get on the ship and another wave and another wave. And this happens at all levels too. It's not just retail, right? This idea of being the poor sod that's left holding the bag, that gets the big money managers chasing each other as well, just trying to beat the other guy. So I can definitely understand why Ray says points three and four are looking frothy. <laughs> and I certainly agree. Okay, lastly, let's have a look at Ray's fifth and sixth point or criteria. And then also uh, number five on my list is big purchases, uh, forward purchases. You know, like if somebody's buying apartments that they don't own because they think that the apartments are going to go up or back in the days where I traded a lot of commodities, I would watch that those who used commodities would rather than buy from hand to mouth, they would get a lot of forward coverage. In other words, buy inventory to protect themselves against the prices going up. And so when they go from, as we have recently seen in commodities, when they go from not uh, having forward coverage because prices went down and they kept falling and they say, I don't want to own it, to and then uh, it going up and they say, I want to pr be protected against it going up, that movement causes a lot of buying and so on. So that's buyers that have extended those forward purchases are an indicator that I use. So there you have two interesting points. Firstly, a big sign of a bubble is definitely people being able to and committing to a lot of debt. That's point five on Ray's list. This is just a classic setup. It's what happened in 2007. You know, people could buy five houses with no income. Um, that's the stripper scene. If you've seen the big short, the, the scene with the stripper, you know, it's where she says, I have five houses and a condo. <laughs> um, and obviously people en masse overextending themselves with debt is just a massive setup for a bubble that can burst very easily because just a little blip can trigger a huge wave of people just start selling their assets because they can't keep up with the cost of their debts and that can force downward price pressure on whatever market you're looking at stocks or real estate or whatever and that can snowball into a big crash no doubt about it so that's point number five and then point number six is you know people buying stuff now stocking up because they fear that prices will be worse in the future and honestly i'm not sure why this is a bubble indicator maybe it's because you know the buying is brought forward so businesses sales look artificially strong now and then will look weak at some point in the future when there's obviously a lull in sales because of that pull forward but honestly i'm not actually too sure on this one maybe i'm missing something obvious maybe i just don't know so please let me know in the comments if you are if you're getting this point way better than i am um but anyway that's point number six 
And if you have a look at Ray Dalio's conclusion of all of these factors today, you can see that Ray Dalio he doesn't seem to think we're in bubble territory just yet. You know, a few of these criteria are frothy in his mind, but if you compare that to his conclusions of the previous three big crashes, you know, he doesn't seem to think that we're in any sort of danger. One thing I find interesting though, which he didn't have to do, but he decided to include anyway, is, you know, his conclusions on emerging tech. See, in that space, he indicates three out of the six criteria are in that bubble stage. So I think reading between the lines here, I think Ray's saying that, you know, he doesn't believe we're in imminent danger of the market exploding, but watch out for emerging tech. Um, but one thing I wanted to touch on lastly is that Ray says in this presentation that he doesn't actually apply these criteria to the market as a whole normally. He actually uses this framework to judge individual businesses. And I think that's really smart. So I wanted to touch on it because we know that we can't time the market. Nobody can. So instead of using a framework like this to try and make a market prediction, trying to predict a market crash, for example, instead use it to help you analyze the individual companies that you've been looking at to invest in. That's where, that's where it might be useful. This table here that I'm showing shows for the stock market as a whole, those items that, you know, are we in a bubble? Is the stock market in a bubble? Well, I apply that basically that framework to all individual securities. And I do that in a systematic way because my process is to write down the criteria, to, to use filters and so on, and, and try to uh, see which are in a, uh, in a bubble. So uh, there are different, different stocks. Some are in bubbles, it seems to me. Some are not in bubbles. And the stock market as a whole uh, is indicated by that table. Let me just go to the next chart. So there you go, use it for individual stocks and don't get caught up in making market predictions. All right, that will just about do us for today's video. I'll let Ray take us home today, but uh, before I do, please remember to leave a like on the video if you did enjoy it or if you found it useful. Subscribe to the channel, of course, if you have not done so already. Also, if you're looking for a step-by-step -step video course on how to start investing either actively or passively, then you can check out Profitful. Links are in the description below. But with that said, I will see you guys next time in the next video. And now let's have Ray Dalio take us home and give us your thoughts, give us your conclusions, Ray, on the current state of the stock market. I'll see you guys next time. You can't say the stock market is in the highest a bubble. You can't even say that it's necessarily in a bubble. You have to distinguish uh, which ones, which stocks um, are in a bubble or have been in a bubble uh, from those that are not in a bubble. There are a lot of stocks that aren't. And um, at that bubble is a little bit like the bond markets bubble. So I hope that gave you a little bit of flavor of uh, bubbles and uh, how I look at them and where we are. Thank you. Hey guys, thanks very much for watching the video. So every now and again, people will reach out to me and ask what stockbroker I use for the trading or the investing that I do over in the United States. And for that, the brokerage site that I use is Stake. Now, Stake has been a long-term sponsor of this channel. And the reason for that is because I really believe in their platform. So what they offer is they offer a brokerage-free trading platform. So you can buy and sell stocks, US listed stocks, uh, brokerage-free. Now, typically, if you went through, say, Comsec, what you would have to pay is you would have to pay, first of all, a foreign exchange fee, and then you would also have to pay international brokerage fees ends up being very expensive. So stakes still do charge the foreign exchange fee, but once your Australian dollars have been converted over to US dollars, then beyond that, the trading is free. So, um, so stake is the one that I use. I really do like their platform. And of course, the reason that I like partnering with them is they give you guys a really good deal. So if you uh, sign up to stake using the referral code AWC, Wow, that's going back. That's back to Aussie wealth creation days, if you remember. So if you sign up using the code AWC uh, and fund your account, you're going to be given one free stock. So, hey, pretty good bonus. It's better than a poke in the eye. So if you'd like to check that out, check out the links down in the description. Thanks to Stake, as always, for helping make this channel financially viable for me and sponsoring this content. And thanks to you guys for watching. I'll see you guys in the next video.